Hi, this is Eric Miller, publisher of The New Colonist, on the phone with Rick Reisenberg, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, plastic and packaging. I just uh, went around the corner to a little market, and I bought bread and celery and onions uh, and chicken broth, and with, with the exception of the onions, which I just pulled out of the bin and put in the, uh, the basket, everything else was wrapped in plastic, either a bag or a or uh, well, the chicken soup was in a paper box, which isn't so damaging. Uh, but the bread was in a bag. The the celery was in a bag. Everything you buy is in a bag these days. And yes, and I'm sure they gave you another bag to put all your bags into. No, because I brought one. <laughs> ah, well, that's good. That's good. Most people, of course, don't. And some people seem absolutely obsessed with uh, bags and bag collection. I was in the market yesterday, and a fellow wanted paper and plastic and everything subdivided into smaller units so each bag was about half full which apparently he was going to put into one of those little pull along luggage things um, so he was getting all his food in bags and, and boxes and it was put into more bags and it was put into about twice as many bags as he needed and each bag was doubled <laughs> and then he put them all into a meta bag which he would then pull along um, that that's not even the half of it because since they did at least put paper bags which are you know however hard they may be in the environment in terms of generating monoculture or tree farms at least they do actually biodegrade and they are readily recyclable what is uh, that the paper bags the paper bags right so he did have paper bags in there and that made it stiffer so you could have theoretically uh filled the bags up all the way, but of course, this being America, you didn't actually do that. I'm uh, just curious. Another lost possibility, <laughs> microscopic just, that may seem. I'm just curious, Rick. At home, do you buy plastic bags for uh, your trash? I mean, the, I sometimes no. when I go to the store, I get plastic bags, but then I use them instead of, you know, purchase trash bags. I refuse to use those because plastic. The only chance you have to biodegrade plastic is if it's exposed to the sunlight. So, of course, once it's gone into a landfill, in effect, you've made a shrine of your garbage, kind of like a, a you know, kind of like an Egyptian mummy of your garbage to last throughout the millennia and never be recycled. Uh, yeah, and I know some places kind of require you to put out your trash in plastic bags, which I think um, governments, uh, city councils, whatever, that have that requirement should be made into slaves for the rest of their lives, is my feeling, uh, preferably working in landfills. But um, I refuse to do it. I use paper bags to line the waste baskets that we do line. We do line some of them. Um, oftentimes I figure, well, it's a waste basket. It's, it was designed, built, born, bred, and trained to hold garbage, so why does it need help? What do you do you know? with things that leak through the, uh, through the paper bag? I let them leak. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, my trash cans are made out of either metal or plastic, uh, both of which are impervious to leakage. Um, I take it and throw it in the garbage. Uh, if it's um, Actually, if it is, this is kind of on the tail end of the packaging issue, whether we started off on the front end, but we'll get back to that. Yeah. If it's uh, kitchen waste, um, and of course, I'm a vegetarian, so very little of the kitchen waste is meat, uh, just what Gina would have once a week or so. But if it's kitchen waste, I put it into this cute little thing that looks like a miniature old-fashioned galvanized trash can. It's, your, it's supposed to be a kitchen composter, but then I pitch it into the because we don't have an actual yard or an apartment, I pitch it into the, the green can that the city provides, and they take it away. The green can is meant for yard waste, but I figure, you know, well, you know, spinach stalks were in a yard once, and it's basically the same thing, wood chips, even wine corks and stuff, because you can put branches in this thing. I put those into the green recycling bin. The green city truck comes up and takes it away to a plant where they uh, make it into fertilizer and resell it to re-enrich the soil. Yeah, unfortunately, um, our building is not set up for that. If I, if I, the the trash has to be in something when I put it outside, or else it's just outside. You don't have any cans, actually. No, there's do no it. cans. Yeah, that's something uh, that uh, you, as a citizen of uh, 
Brooklyn should work on with your government, with your local representatives, because it's abominable. Uh, and of course, you always have like the transfer station controversies over there and the garbage scow controversy. Didn't they have a garbage scow that was kind of wandering the seas like the Flying Dutchman and could never, could never dock anywhere with a bunch of New yeah. York garbage? Uh, I think this is about uh, somewhere between five and ten years ago. It was, it would have been comical, except, you know what to do. Some, some right. places take the garbage out in scows and then pitch it overboard or dump it through a, some kind of hopper on the bottom of the ship that they can open without sinking it. Well, speaking uh, of dumping, dumping it overboard, uh, we, we, were both, we both mentioned uh, before we started the call, everybody else has probably heard about it by this point, a massive plastic of an undeterminable size, or, or at least a, uh, a variety of estimates as to its size, uh, in the Pacific Ocean. Yes, yeah, so you think you're talking about the Great Pacific Garbage Gyre, exactly. um, which is a kind of rotating, slowly rotating current that's been gathering garbage from the west coast of, of the United States and from Japan and I suppose also from China and slowly concentrating it in this vast area, several hundred square miles, I think, in the slightly west of the Central Pacific. That's the most obvious one, of course, uh, because it's, it's so abominable and so ghastly that, you know, just going there and filming it and, and quoting people the stats is, is, you know, shocking to them. Most of the garbage there is um, beverage bottles, water bottles, and plastic bags. But there's something worse. I just saw on uh, TED.org, and I'll probably post this to our blog after we finish this conversation, a talk by Charles Moore, who specializes in uh, oceanic garbage. And um, he was talking about it's not just in the Great uh, Pacific Garbage Gyre, that's the most obvious place, but it's everywhere. He, he had uh, photos of remote islands, uh, I mean islands, uninhabited islands in the middle of nowhere, and bottles and bottle caps and uh, six-pack, um, you know, those little six-pack retainers that are so good at catching birds. Uh, the little rings that are on bottle tops that you s that hold it shut as a security device, and you crack that to open the bottle. All right. Uh, he showed a picture of a turtle who had gotten caught in one of those and grew around it, so the turtle's waist is only like two inches around, but the rest of the turtle is like a foot across. And um, and it's everywhere. Yachts uh, yachts people describe garbage over the seas wherever they go. Now yachts follow the old sailing ship uh, routes because they're mostly wind powered and so they go into areas that the container ships don't go because they follow great circle routes. Garbage floating everywhere. I saw an estimate and this was several years ago that there's on the average one piece of visible garbage per every square meter of the oceans everywhere at this point. Uh, can you repeat, uh, that? repeat that statistic? About one visible piece of garbage, not necessarily a great big one, but you know, visible if you're someone looking for garbage, for every square meter of the ocean over the entire seven seas of the earth. Um, almost all of it, of course, is plastic. Paper dissolves metal sinks. Um, so let's be specific. Plastic garbage. Bottles and packaging waste and plastic bags. Now this fellow Moore in this um, talk mentioned that he, he does research on this and they were doing what they call a microplankton troll and drawing these very fine nets through the water for a spe specified distance and originally they were used to see how much plankton there was in the water to see the richness of the particular area but now he's using it to catch little tiny bits of garbage these are bits of garbage you would not see they're you know maybe two or three times the size of a grain of sand and they're most of them, again, bits of plastic that have been worn off the garbage we throw out and been worn down in little bits, and the fish eat them. And he measured one fish that was like less than three inches long and found 80 pieces of, of, uh, of this tiny plastic in its stomach. Huh. It's been a real big thing that people have uh, so got we're, that has... So we're, oh, we're eating this plastic then, if we're eating That's right, fish. because those fish eat the plastic, other fish eat them, other fish eat them, you eat the fish, you know. And, of course, these plastics, what are they going to do? Are they going to carry their garbage around till they get home and put it in the recycling bin? Are they going to even walk to the corner, assuming they even can walk after eating fast food for a lifetime, and put it in the garbage can there? Are they going to keep it in the car? No, they throw it in the gutter. 
I mean, I even see it in my neighborhood. It's an expensive neighborhood, you know, and I see trash in the gutter all the time. Um, and of course, it washes down into the drains and into the storm drains and washes out into the ocean in spite of the garbage boom on Bayona Creek, which is usually like jam packed with styrofoam cups and clamshells from fast food joints. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. <laughs>